I'm Jem Aswad, Senior Music Editor of Variety. This is Mr. Anthony Ginn. Hello. Sheffield Spawned musician responsible for the music you heard uh, in the uh, excerpt clip, reel, whatever, that we just saw from Peaky Blinders. Going from violence and debauchery and madness and substance abuse to sex and back again. All my favorite things. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just by way of quick background, before he did what he does now, Anthony was a member or a touring member of Pulp, touring member of Elastica, and a collaborator with the great Joe Strummer, which I am going to ask you about later once we talk a bit more about Peaky Blinders. So I suppose my first question would be, how do you soundtrack that kind of action? How do you not make it repetitive? How do you keep it fresh? Oh, uh, how do you keep it fresh? Well, um, there was a definite basis with Peaky Blinders because it's been three seasons. So um, it was Killian who called me, he was an old friend of mine, and he asked me if I'd be interested in getting involved. And when I say I, I mean we, me and my partner Martin Slattery, who's not here today, he lets me do the talking and he does more interesting things like hang out with his kids and go on bike rides and things like that and leaves me to talk shit. Um, and um, so Kill called me and said, uh, you know, do you want to get involved in Peaky Blinders? And he actually asked me if I was interested in, um, you know, overseeing the, the music content because they'd had a lot of, the Peaky Blinders had been based on a lot of songs since series one. I think there was almost 50 songs in the first series and the second series and upwards of 35 in the second, in the third series. To which I replied, no, I wouldn't be interested in that at all. But I would be interested in completely and utterly doing the whole music and, um, you know, taking a fresh approach to it. Um, because I'd watched Peaky Blinders and I definitely thought that in season three, it just annoys me sometimes when there's like really clumsy ins and outs from tracks. Uh, there's a definite art form to editing the tracks together. Um, so I said if we could have a bit more free reign and people were up for doing something a bit different and pushing it further forward um, and getting, getting artists involved to do music, then I would definitely be up for it. And um, somehow I managed to bullshit my way into convincing them that that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, he was largely the one who sort of pushed it through. Now, did that drive the show's music budget up or did it, or was it roughly the same? Well, you know, I, I don't do know. All I, know all I, I don't care about shit like that. You know, anyone who thinks there's a lot of money in being a composer on a TV show like Peaky Blinders is living in dream world, which makes it funny that we're sit here, sat here in a place called the Cash Factory. Yeah. <laughs> in your dreams. I made my piece a long time ago with the fact that there ain't really much money in the cool shit. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to do cool shit, then forget about making money or, you know, play the long game because it's the only game in town. But um, so as far as the budget's concerned, I don't know. We got paid um, what we got paid and we just got stuck into it. And we got stuck into it hard. One of the things that annoys me about um, modern day music in films and television is that you can just hear, I can play guess the temp when there's temp music used. Um, and, and I'm pretty good at it as well. And I feel sorry for composers, myself included. I feel sorry for myself. <laughs> God. Uh, no, but you know, because you walk in and go, well, we've got this. Can you make something a bit like this? And then people just end up ripping it off, you know. I mean, if I hear another fucking version of Time from Inception by Hans Zimmer, copied by somebody, even copied by Hans, <laughs> um, uh, who I love, by the way, who's a beauty geezer, um, you know, but I just don't need to hear that shit copied anymore. Come on. Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, what was the question? Uh, no, the question was, were they open to what you wanted to bring yeah, to Yeah, they were totally open to it. You have to bulldoze your way through things and lie to people. You know, you have to tell them that you're going to do something, then just do what you want and make it think that it's their idea. You know, that's, wow. the, that's the way to do anything, you know. Mm -hmm in life. That's a good piece of life advice. Mm -hmm. You know, make people think it's their idea. Um, but you know, we, we, we wanted to use, uh, basically Killian is super into music, super into new music, and, and he's a real music junkie. He's got his own uh, radio show now on Six Music. So from the beginning we were talking about what 
we wanted on it, you know, and, and, and the big watchword was outlaw. They've got to be outlaws, man. Tommy Shelby's an outlaw. Nick Cave's an outlaw. PJ Harvey's an outlaw. Jack White's an outlaw. And that was the kind of vibe. So I just wanted to bring that kind of vibe into it. But, um, you know, outlaws don't always come in the form of big bang crash wallop music, you know, which is why we asked Laura Marlin to do something, who I consider to be an outlaw and a badass. She is both of those things, absolutely. Yeah. And she was amazing when she came in and, you know, we did two tracks with her. We did a track with Iggy Pop and Jarvis. Obviously, I know Jarvis since I was a kid and I, maybe I just, you know, used my connections. So, Jarvis, you know Iggy, get him on the phone. <laughs> Let's get Iggy Pop on a tune. And that was wicked doing the track with Iggy because me and Jarvis are like, you know, we're just lads from Sheffield who are into music who've been listening to Iggy our whole lives. And I'm like, we're doing a fucking tune with Iggy Pop, man. Um, did he come in or did you do No, it? we did it on Source Connect. Uh, right. So Source Connect's a thing where you have the, in real time, you do the track, but he's, he was sat on a stool drinking tea um, and he just came in and just killed it. It was unbelievable. He was looking at me through the camera going, who's that? Going, <laughs> uh, this is Ant. Ant, like the insect? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. And then we did a take, and I said, Iggy, could you do it? Like, yeah, cool. And then he just did what he wanted. And I was like, yeah, of course. You know, like you said. That's for Iggy Pop. You get Iggy Pop, you know. Was he wearing a shirt? He was wearing a shirt, yeah. Uh, particularly stylish one. Ah, uh, when I saw it, when, when I met him last year, he was wearing a shirt, but it was wide open, which was seeing, uh, showing a bit more than I would have. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how did you get into this line of work after, you know, touring with bands and working with Strummer and Pulp and... Well, um, I don't know. I just, I ain't got a manager. Uh, me and Martin, so, so Martin Slattery, who did all the music with me and we've been working together for 25 years, who is an absolute genius musician um, and musical maestro. Um, he used to play with a band called Black Grape. He's a multi-instrumentalist, plays loads of instruments like a badass. Um, and, um, you know, we just kind of bumble around, bumping into people, bumping into shit, you know. I ended up working with Joe Strummer because I went up to him in a bar and said, hey, man, you're Joe Strummer. What the fuck are you doing with your life? You know, and he'd not made a record for 10 years. like, what the fuck is this guy? And I was like, you know, get that Telecaster out of its box, get it round your neck and make a record, man. You're born to be on stage. We got drunk for three hours and two weeks later we were in the studio. And 10 weeks later he was back on stage after a 10-year hiatus. So... The idea of um, kind of having any kind of career plan or, ooh, if we do Peaky Blinders, then maybe we can do something else. Maybe just, you know, that, that's just not what we're about. We're, we're into, we're music junkies. We, we love it and um, we don't really have a plan. <laughs> we don't, but my plan is to be able to do really interesting shit and make it different all the time. I, don't, I certainly don't want to go from one TV show to the next TV show. I think that playing badminton makes you better at football. I think that, you know, you exercise a whole different bunch of muscles. At the moment, we're doing a ballet in Switzerland, and we play with a 60-piece orchestra every night. Um, You're doing a ballet. Yeah, we wrote a ballet, an 83-minute ballet, and that's what we've been doing. I was doing that two nights ago in a pit with an orchestra, uh, a, sh a version of Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. So we just kind of go around bumping into stuff and, you know, figuring things out. We've been making a lot of hip-hop recently working with the incredible yeah. dude from Harlem called Aesop Rocky. So, you know. I didn't know that, really. Yeah, well, I just bumped into him in a, uh -huh. in a hotel. And he uh -huh. says, hey, dude, what you been doing? I know him through my friend Brian Burton, Danger Mouse, who's yeah. an amazing producer and amazing dude, full stop. And uh, so I've hung out with Rocky in the past, and uh, he was like, what you been doing, man? I says, I've been doing this TV show, Peaky Blinders. He goes, Peaky Blinders, I love that shit. Tommy Shelby, he my man. <laughs> And then I said to him, well, funnily enough, he'd just done this track. Uh, at the time, he'd just released this track with Skepta, um, which, which became a massive track. And one of my proudest things about uh, the work we did on Peaky Blinders is that we managed to get Skepta into Peaky Blinders. Because in that showreel there was uh, a track is shut down by Skepta. And in the show, there's a, um, a character called Jessie Eden, and she's the... Bolshevik union leader and she shuts the factory down and I thought mm, shuts that factory down how can I sneak a bit of uh, you know grime London grime because also Peaky Blinders 
not because it's a racist show, but because of the time it's from. It's the whitest show in the world. You know, it's got one, Benjamin Zephaniah, brilliant Benjamin Zephaniah is in it. But, um, you know, and the music has always been very kind of white guitar music, really. So I kind of snuck in some grime through the back door and got Skep on the firm. And we did it four times. And I met him the other week. And I was like, I'm the geezer who put in Peaky Blinders. He went, no way, man. I says, yeah. And then I put it in the Jaguar advert, which we did, which, you know, I earned him some corn, I tell you. I'll bet. So anyway, he bought me an orange juice. Did, um, are you classically trained? No, I'm a classically trained. No way, man. Okay. No way. There's only you, four and things And you wrote a important. ballet. You just, you just winged it. Well, I didn't wing it. Music exists inside your head, you know. Art exists inside your head. The idea, all the rest is just school, you know. People that can, there are people that can tell amazing stories, you know, in the boozer to people who can't read and write. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just maths. Can you read music? No, of course I can't. But Martin can. Martin's a badass classically trained musician from being five. So we do, you know, we, I, I have that to lean on, but, but, um, it's overrated, really, because you learn a lot of rules um, and, and regulations that you can't break through. Mm. And I always think, say, there's only four things that are important in music. Two of them are stuck on the side of your head. Right. One of them beats in your chest, and one of them's there, your guts. Does it sound good? Mm. Does it feel good? Has it got some fucking blood and guts? Has it got some attitude? That's what's important in music. I mean, you know, think about it, the most famous guitar lick in, hi in the history of rock and roll. Sounds like it was written by a five-year-old that just picked up a guitar three seconds before. <laughs> so the idea that you have to go to school and learn all this stuff, and you know, you're, you're learning from the moment that you listen to music. You know, I was learning from the first time I listened to John Barry, who I've got a tattoo of on my arm. Oh. He's a Yorkshireman, oh. yeah. Nice. There you go. You can't the first it. song I loved when I was five, exactly, could be Ebony and Ivory by Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder for all I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it isn't. I'll sing you the song that it is, though. It's the greatest Louis Armstrong impression you're going to hear today. Oh, yeah, there's, there's a tattoo uh, artist laughing his head off somewhere. <laughs> the time in the world. Come on, it's not bad, right? That's pretty good. That is pretty good. So I was, for, I, was, I was falling in love with music from being a kid, you know. My brother was into James Bond, and um, he had this James Bond record, and I fell in love with John Barry, and I fell in love with that song, and I fell in love with another piece of music, which is called Journey to Blofeld's Hideaway from an incredible um, James Bond film called On a Magic Secret Service. He got married in that film, and his wife died. Oh. Um, and, um, and just this magical sounds, these French horns and these high strings in unison. You fall in love with it. You're educating yourself, you know. The idea that you have to go to school to be good at music is bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. You just find someone to work with who did. Well, there's, you know, doing anything in life, you find something, you find a way to do it. I, I did movies outside of working with mine, mm -hmm. you know. And in this day and age... And the, the way I got into it was because I was producing a record for this guy, for this project called Uncle with James Lavelle, and I got to work with some cool people, Ian Brown and 3D from Massive Attack and Josh Homme from the Queens of Stone Age, who was this amazing guy. And um, we were doing some string arrangements, and I got this string arranger in, and no one liked what he did. And I'd already booked the orchestra for Friday morning. I called up my friend David Arnold, who uh, I'd done some stuff with in the past, big film composer. And he said, you know what you're doing, man. Just get some violin sounds, some cello sounds, some basses, write it yourself. And then get someone in to write all the notes. You know what to do. And I was like, fuck, I better do it, because otherwise I've lost 16 grand or whatever the orchestra cost. I'm going to look like a right nightmare producer. Anyway, that's what I did. And you know what? They came in on Friday morning. It's pretty simple what I did. But, you know, you, you learn to do things by diving in. To things, you know. Well, that seems to be the the main takeaway from it. Um, how did you get started as a musician? What was your first What was your first endeavor? Um, well, I was in Pulp when I was sixteen. I was playing the Fruit Machine in uh, the Hallamshire Hotel in Sheffield, and um, Jarvis said to me, "Do you fancy playing bass in our band?" I said, "I've never played bass." He said, "Don't worry about that. No, none of us can really play very well. It's only got four strings, and we only use two. So, um, so I joined them for a bit. And, um, you know, it's been a roller coaster ever since. I was very lucky to meet Martin um, in 1996. We've got a really great symbiotic relationship. He, he can definitely do things that I can't do. 
I can do things I think that he can't do, but together it's like two halves of the same brain. We've worked together on a lot of things for for a long time. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a, a pretty harmonious relationship. We have a motto, which is the, the music is in charge. And, the, and when you're doing music to picture like Peaky, you know, um, the picture is in charge, the, the story is in charge, the narrative is in charge. And it doesn't matter, you can't force yourself on it. But we were lucky on Peaky to work with amazing people who who gave us a lot of um, their talent. You know, everything's a collaboration on this kind of stuff. You know, the idea that you, you come in and you're like, oh, I'm going to do this because I'm great. It's bullshit. Mm. You know, everything's a collaboration. We had a great editors on there um, and uh, an exec producer, a guy called Jamie Glazebrook, who was great. Um, and it's called Dan Roberts. And we just got in. I have a friend called Atticus Ross, who's an old friend of mine, brilliant film composer, works with Trent Reznor uh, a lot. And he said to me, if you're doing a TV show, just get in and make loads of music before you've done anything. And we made 51 pieces of music before we started. Mm -hmm. So that, it says, then no fucker can temp, you know, temp anyone else's music into it. Mm -hmm. So we gave the editors 51 pieces of music, ranging from the stuff you heard on there, beautiful soft piano things and things with acoustic guitars and, and then just balls out rock and roll, like peaky stuff. And then we pulled people in to do stuff, like my friend Ollie from Yak is singing on one of those tunes. Flea from the Chili Peppers is playing bass on one of those tunes, who's an old friend of mine. He was in town. I said, get up to the studio. Mm -hmm. And he came up and played. And Stella from Warpaint, amazing drummer, played on that track with Flea. So, you know, you just have to cajole people and bully people into collaborating with you. <laughs> well, you've also got a very wide circle of acquaintances. I mean, gee, just the ones you rattled off there, that's like 50 years of, a 50 year span of artists. Well, I'm 48, but you know. Wow. <laughs> um, Iggy's a bit older than us. Yeah, Iggy is, yeah. I don't know, man. You, I've been around music for a while and you meet people and, and you got to be fearless and you just got to think of yourself as an equal. You can't be going, oh, that guy's that guy, that guy's that. It's all music. No one knows what they're doing. Everyone's just fishing. The idea that everyone, anyone knows what they're doing is bullshit. Everyone's just fishing. And if you put your rod in the river early in the morning, you get up early, you get a few rods and get some good bait, you've got more chance of catching a fish. If you work your ass off, you know, be you Eminem or Iggy Pop or Beethoven, you've got to work your ass off. And surprise, surprise, good things can happen if you do that. When you're doing the music for Peaky, I mean, it feels like getting the vocalist would be more time consuming than just like the usual score thing. And the music usually goes into a show last. I mean, is more time budgeted for you to make the music for it? Well, budgeted, no. But, we, but as in money, no. But a, we just, a, a portion. We, just got, we only have, we have only one setting of how to do things, which is full force, 100 million percent. 100% of the time, you know, I think there's loads of money in doing Peaky Blinders or writing ballets in Switzerland, you're dreaming, you know, but you do it because you love music and you're passionate and you want it to be as good as possible. So we probably worked on Peaky a lot longer than anyone else. We worked on it for like five months, mm -hmm. you know, and did a lot of stuff. And every time you do a little track, it's got to sound like a track. But people were saying, um, you know, what's this track? I've been trying to Shazam it. I don't know what band it is. It's like, it's not a band, man. It's for four minute 48 piece of music that we wrote that dips under the dialogue. And it's, you know, the bit at the end where it goes, no, hey, that's me singing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, you know, that's what you got to do if you want to do something that really fits and tailors a scene. It really annoys me when things dip down and it's not right, you know? So that's why we attacked it in the way that we did. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do something fresh and interesting. If it was up to me, we would have done more of that. You know, we did, we put a track in from Savages, but I was talking to Jenny about coming and doing an original track with us because I think that I personally think that um, you know music supervision in television and stuff, um, not to be controversial, but I think it can be pretty tired. I mean, I was watching this show that I loved called Patrick Melrose. And the same week in Patrick Melrose and in Handmaid's Tale, they used Feeling Good by Nina Simone in the same show. And I mean, Michael Bublé did a cover of that song. I mean, one's about a dystopian world where women's bodies are used to create babies and then they're brutally hung. And the other one is about a geezer who was raped by his dad and became a heroin addict and a crackhead. And it's like, let's use a song that people might confused for Michael Bublé for those two things. It's like Nina Simone made 23 albums. Let's dig a bit deeper. You know, that's just me. Not that I want to bitch on anyone that involved in those shows because I loved both of them and I love both of them, but I just think 
Nina Simone, one of the greatest female artists, uh, male, any human artist of all time, surely, you know. Well, who else do you think is doing a good job at what you're doing? in terms of music. There's loads of people, there's loads of talent out there. One great thing about like this new world of all these documentaries and all these Netflix shows is that I sometimes watch things and think the music this is wicked and I Google who it is and I've never even heard of them. And they're brilliant and the music's wicked. There's talent everywhere. You know, if television and Netflix and all these shows have shown us anything is that you don't have to go to the usual suspects. Dig a bit deeper, find someone that hasn't done something that's with a new sound and a fresh approach. You know, I think that there's so many talented people out there. If television has taught us anything, there's a revolution in television. The Sopranos, The Wire, uh, Game of Thrones, three of the greatest television shows ever made. Not one known famous actor in any of them. You know, maybe Sean Bean from Sheffield, who was in the first episode of Game of Thrones. He's also a Sheffield United fan. Uh, knew that we, got was Premier, we got promoted to the Premier League, everybody. Um, but, you know, that's not bad. It's like... I get sick of this, hearing the same old thing. Go, oh, and here's the music composed by da 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 da. It's like, oh, no shit, Sherlock. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, come on, there's so much talent in this world. Dig a bit deeper. It's, You're asking people to try. I'm asking people to be brave, you know, and, and also asking studio execs and people with the money to, to have a bit more respect for their audience because... At the end of the day, what people want is incredible stories, acted brilliantly, and, you know, played with conviction and passion. That's what they want, you know. And if, if last year's Oscars has taught us anything, you know, Olivia Coleman, uh, 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 you know, a woman who was in Peep Show, winning an Oscar, and Roma being nominated for so much stuff, a black and white film in a foreign language with unknown actors, mm -hmm. which I think is an infinitely better film than Gravity, because when I seen Gravity, which I think is an incredible film on lots of levels, but I just couldn't help thinking when George Clooney come on the, the, the screen, oh, there's that guy that sells tequila and coffee. It's, it's like so much talent in this world. Let's stop doing the same old shit. Well, speaking of which, were you working on Peaky, the ballet, and the hip-hop project at the same time? Uh, well, we like to dip around doing different things. On a daily basis, it's better for you. Uh -huh. If you can work on a bit here and a, you know, and a bit there. We did lots of stuff that year. You know, we, we did. I did a movie with Woody Harrelson, which was the first ever live streamed movie, the only ever live streamed movie, which was insane. And the, Woods, the only person that I know is insane enough to attempt something like that. Mm -hmm. So it was a live score as well. Well, I mixed the whole thing live. Right. Okay. Uh, as it, we kind of did it before, but yeah, we're always just working on other things. I'm producing this brilliant young Irish band called Inhaler at the moment. So. Did that for three days last week, then went to do the ballet. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to keep it fresh, man. Keep it interesting. You only get one try on the block in this life. Last thing you want to do is just get, you know, I, I know friends who do big, big movies. And if I call them up now and go, what are you up to? And they go, doing a movie. <laughs> like, yeah? How's that going? It's all right. What are you going to do next year? Might do some movies. It's like, you know, Hans Zimmer went off and went on tour and did loads of live stuff. I've never seen him look so alive, you know, when I saw him. Afterwards, he's like, yeah, man, I'm out on tour, you know? Usually he's, you know, trapped in his studio at midnight on a Saturday night, you know? Do you still play live? Well, we have been playing live with the orchestra. We've been playing live every night for, not every night, but we're doing 13 shows in Switzerland with a 60-piece orchestra. Um, so we're going to start playing live. Actually, mm -hmm. we're doing a, a gig, a few gigs quite soon, but we don't really know what we're going to do yet. But then again, I've never known what the fuck I'm doing, so I'm pretty comfortable <laughs> with that. That seems to be the recurring theme. Um, we're down to uh, 57 seconds, the clock tells us. Jesus Christ! Yes. Is there anything more, any more wisdom you'd like to impart? Uh, no. <laughs> Even with Have 45 no seconds? Have no fear. Swim against the tide. You know, I watched that movie, Dead Poets Society, when I was a kid, and it had a massive effect on me. Just the whole thing, you know. Oh, me, oh, life. Walt Whitman was born 200 years ago, three days ago. And, um, you know, it, there's a brilliant bit in that where Mr. Keating, God rest his soul, and the dear departed Robin Williams uh, said, at the end of that poem, it says, you know, the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be, is what he says. And I just don't want my verse to be the same old fucking verse as everyone else's. 
Well, I don't see how it could be on the basis of what you've been doing lately. Um, we've got, does anyone have any questions? Anyone want to ask anything? Uh, I see nothing. So I reckon we're done. Okay. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.